Hi everyone, welcome back to Uncensor. I'm Marianne, your host for On the Ads Mermaids, and today I have Jessie Mendes. Hi, Jessie. Thanks for being here. She is the director of a mystery school for women called Wild Essence, and she's also a womb uh, trauma expert. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so you guys may be wondering, what the heck is Jessie doing here today, right? <laughs> what does she have to do with yachting? Uh, and funny enough, I just, uh, Jessie just told me that she actually has a really good friend of her who has been a yachty for a, while, for a mm -hmm. long time now. And uh, yeah, that was something I didn't know. So there's obviously definitely a thread there. And yeah. the main reason why I have asked Jessie, I invited Jessie uh, here today is because as you guys know, we've been talking and exposing a lot of the traumatic experiences that, you know, crew in yachts are actually um, exploring or experiencing it. Uh, so we're talking about work harassment, sexual harassment, sexual abuse, and all that stuff. And um, yeah, I just felt the call to bring somebody who, uh, you know, who has helped heal these type of traumas uh, with other people. And uh, yeah, and just kind of like talk a little bit about what we can do after uh, we're experiencing that and how we can heal from that. And um, also why are we getting ourselves in that type of situations, right? Because I think this is the number mm -hmm. one questions for, for many people out there listening to these shows is like, why is this happening? You know, especially yeah. the ones that are actually experiencing the the trauma is like what you mean right so yeah. when you hear all this jesse what's coming up for you uh overthrowing the patriarchy now <laughs> um <laughs> basically there's a there's definitely a, a significant number of patterns that are ingrained in all of us that are are perpetuating all of this and it's obviously an, an, an atrocious thing to hear about some of the, the misconduct and the, the violence that's done onto women all over the planet all the time. And of course, I'm, I'm constantly experiencing the effects of that as women come to me after the fact and after as they're navigating some of the challenges that can occur on the other side of those kind of traumas like endometriosis and PCOS and infertility and wonky cycles and all the stuff that can happen when the body is remembering and recycling traumatic experiences over and over and over again. So I'm of course saying, well, I would love to get to the place where we can pull it before it happens, you know, that we can actually start to re-educate society so that these circumstances are not as prevalent and also re-educate women so that we know how to advocate for ourselves, how to stand in our power and how to change the structures that need to change. So I think that's a really good point. And I, th mm -hmm. I believe that it starts with the individual, right? Because yeah. it's, it's like, we are the system, right? We're the collective, we're the, the society. So each individual, yeah. you know, the more each person changes, then obviously it has, the, the collective has to change. Um, and I love the fact that you said something along the lines, how to prevent right the situations right so yes. um what i have been hearing in the industry is that women are going through and obviously i'm not saying men don't go through this i'm sure there's many men that have mm -hmm. gone through this type of situations but i'm just going sure. to talk directly about women because this is what i uh what i know mm -hmm. so a lot of women that are have come to me uh they have talked about you know sexual harassment, sexual abuse, rape, uh, work harassment, bullying. And the number one thing that I see across the border is that they believe somehow that these type of behaviors, these type of experiences on yachts is normal. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how can somebody prevent something that's normal, right? Or considered normal? Well, we have to recognize that the implications we're experiencing are proving that it's not. So when we see things like PTSD and all of the, the symptomatic responses to trauma that I just named, it's clearly not okay if it's causing these things. And I think more and more across the board in all systems, people are starting to, and, and by people, I mean oftentimes bleeding people or those who identify as women are starting to recognize that there's something that is missing in the way that we are educated from the ground up 
And oftentimes it comes through an illness or a trauma or something like that, that we go, wait a minute, something in the matrix is, is messed up here. So what's unfortunate is that oftentimes it takes that for us to see that it's not normal. And so it's, it's up to those of us who have experienced these kinds of things to, to call out how much it's not okay. We have to be the ones that draw attention to the fact that like there, there are systemic problems here in the way that we're educated and the, the things that we grow up understanding and, and choosing to and learning to accept. And as women, it's, it's a series of things from not wearing spaghetti string tank tops because it might make boys look at us rather than teaching boys to have respect. Right. So it's those kind of systems that, that are creating a lot of these challenges in the first place. And it's also the repression of, of our voices from a very young age that makes us feel like we can't speak but the work that we need to do internally with ourselves is what builds up the strength to be like, Hey, no, not going to tolerate that. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Right. You know, these kinds of things that will immediately start to reshape and, and kind of set people back a little bit. Like, wait a minute, did she just say no to something that I thought was okay or, or things like that. My friend actually who, who works on yachts was specifically reading a book called misogyny on the book on the boat <laughs> with, <Okay. laughs> with a group of guys. And so that provoked a lot of conversations and she would bring that up to me frequently that how difficult it is to get through some of this information. But the fact that she kept trying to do it anyway was what I was so proud of her for and that she wouldn't tolerate, you know, the mistreatment that was um, around her and that she would bring up the issues and report the issues and raise her voice in moments when it needed to be raised and not only on her own behalf but on the behalf of the women who were there with her exactly. so i'm incredibly proud of her for that and she's really what i think is a is a role model for what needs to start happening yeah so one of the things that i have seen uh, throughout the show and what people have um you know approached me with right their stories is the threat of I don't feel um, confident enough or I don't feel, uh, I don't know what the word is, but they feel threatened if they speak, yeah. basically. Yeah, they feel like they're gonna lose their jobs, which is exactly. a historical thing, yeah. Lose their job or they're not going to be, um, uh, there's not gonna be somebody backing them up, you know? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. of maybe a situation they heard somebody happen to, or maybe they have experience where they have spoken and the captains are like, well, you know, do you, under do you understand who the owner is? Or, and they just basically don't do anything, right? And then yeah. you're kind of like left there. And obviously it's a choice to stay. And that was probably a poor choice on their side. Um, mm -hmm. So what's happening in the mindset of somebody who goes through these experiences and uh, decides to stay there. Because I, I mm -hmm. recently heard a story of a big bow, like 80 meter plus, where stewardesses, as they're hired, they're told, do not be alone on any cabin because the um, security guys, they will rape you. And yet, they are given this information and women are still taking the job. And I mean, maybe they need the money. I don't, I don't, I mean, in my in my mind it just doesn't make any sense if i need the money or not is not something i want to put myself through because that's a really big um <laughs> you know that's a, that that's that's too much for me you know i don't i don't know how these people are still employed I, that that's astounding to me that that's not something that's been so aggressively put on blast and that's the thing that doesn't happen enough it's like the fact that we, we get that story. That needs to be publicized to the point of, of outrage. There need to be enough women like me going, this is not okay, to the people in charge. And, and that's what needs to happen. So I think that there's, there's, there's a couple components. So why are they stepping into these spaces? Well, why do women stay in abusive relationships? Why do we subject ourselves to mistreatment when we are able to intellectually identify that it's not acceptable, but some part of us says, apparently I'm going to do it anyway, right? And, and there's, each woman is different. I'm not going to speak on behalf of everybody's experience, but there is a, a common thread of, um, 
needing to suppress our femininity in order to make ends meet in the world. So that our feminine experience is considered to be more of a curse than it, than the gift that it actually is. And so we're kind of putting it aside and putting our entire, you know, that half of our experience, which to me, like there's the dark and the light half of the whole kind of thing. So that's, that's a huge component of who we are. And, and we ultimately put that aside to step into these spaces, just like you were talking a little bit about menstrual cycles. It's like, we're supposed to hide that and pretend like it's not happening and just keep going along with the same level of energy every day of the month when that's not even minutely close to what's happening hormonally in our bodies and makes zero sense for us to function in that way. Um, and we are not designed to function in that way. And so what happens is it's a repression that we're doing to ourselves that's saying, for some reason, I'm going to allow this, whatever the reason is. And a core need for women on the planet is safety and stability. And sometimes we will compromise um, our bodies and sacrifice our bodies and sacrifice our our honor on behalf of that safety and stability. And that's that's a challenging thing to navigate internally. But there is very often a piece of us that doesn't believe we're worthy of more respect than that. Absolutely. And and that's really hard. That's a hard piece. And it's in it's in most of us in some way or another. And in many of us, it's not just that we don't believe we're worthy. It's that we believe our output in the world, what we do equals how worthy we are. And so if we are trying to create a stable life for ourselves, if we're trying to make those things happen, we could potentially put ourselves in dangerous situations because we think that that's going to gain us the stability and the safety that we need in the world. And we will compromise our, our dignity, our honor and our needs because that's just the world, how it is kind of thing. And I did air quotes that you can't see, but that's just the way the world is kind of thing. And that's the stuff that we have to stop doing because if we don't stop doing that, then we're feeding the monster. We're feeding the system that's perpetuating this conduct rather than going, wait, what did you just say? You said that if I get on your, uh, if I sign on to this employment position, um, you're telling me that I will be sexually assaulted. Um, okay, everyone in the world's about to know about that. Right. Thank you very much for informing me. So this is one of the things, and and I, you know, I uh, I talk a lot about we gotta speak up. You know, like mm -hmm. we cannot continue to hide. Um, and yeah. it's not about shaming men or shaming the perpetrator because you know everybody has a role in this world. But yeah. it's if things if we want to change, and I feel like more than than uh more than it is to be about more than it is about the perpetrator and stopping the mm -hmm. perpetrator is more about actually us as a woman in this case right as an individual mm -hmm. really like you said like raising ourselves and mm -hmm. putting ourselves in the place that we're meant to be mm -hmm. so this shit stops you know yeah. what i mean so it's like, so we don't need this role anymore because we already right. are where we need to be, you know? So it's mm -hmm. like right now, in a way, we do need that perpetrator because we still need enough push for people to speak up, which is so yeah. rough. <laughs> uh, it's, you know? it's really unfortunate because the doorways to so much, to so much growth is through a very painful, um, oftentimes traumatic experience that we go, oh, wait a minute, everything about this is not okay. And if it's, I mean, I would also say in addition that one other component to that perpetrator no longer having any fuel would be for those men who are capable of recognizing that there is an injustice happening around them, those voices need to get louder. Yes. We, we need a, an honorable masculine presence. We need a, the protector role to exist within ourselves as women and in the men around us. So as the men of the world are waking up a little bit more, they're starting to go, wait a minute. So women who sign on to this job are told they're going to be raped. Like I'm not okay with that. Let me be a person who's also not okay with that so that this person doesn't have to stand alone. So rather than the men who may be listening now thinking, well, this doesn't really apply to me because I'm a man. It's like, this absolutely applies to you. These are your sisters, your aunts, your daughters, your granddaughters. Like these are, 
this is this is the the human community and it absolutely does apply to you and i think that that role needs to be enhanced as well we need to we need to have more men stepping into more honorable places and more women using their voices and i think as women raise their voices men start looking and going wait a minute what's happening here oh i also believe that's wrong and then that you know yeah totally so it's so too, it's twofold one of the things about raising our voice as women is you know that that whole thing of like oh um i'm afraid right and <laughs> at first i'm like i was so fired up when all these people were coming to me and telling me all these stories i was like hell no to the no you know like what is happening but yeah. um you know i did my homework legally and obviously i because i haven't i am not the victim of it, that situations right right I'm not really i cannot um say names because right. maybe that's uh, that can get you in of trouble course. so obviously if you are the victim of that situation you are You, you're not going to get in trouble for speaking the name of the person because you actually uh, went through that and that's your own experience. But yes. basically, uh, I can't do it for you. Yes, uh, I know. But my question is, so, so a lot of the times we think we need to call out the person, the, the person the, that actually did it, right? Because we, mm -hmm. this is the thing, a lot of these stories, they have names. And these are mm -hmm. names that are very well known in the industry. You know, yeah. we're talking about the same thing of, of like Hollywood, you know? So <laughs> these are very powerful people with a lot of money, blah, 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 right? Mm -hmm. Which I don't even know what, why we need to uh, really be afraid of, of that. But um, so a lot of people stop themselves for, for, uh, from coming out and, you know, uh, speaking their story because they don't want, they feel that if they do, they're gonna get in trouble, they're never gonna get a job and blah, blah, blah. Um, Mm -hmm. Now, does it really matter if we say the name or can this woman feel, you know, it's like, if I believe, yes, if somebody did something like that to me, I would call the person out. Like, yeah. absolutely, to authorities, to everything. But that's yes. my own personal choice, right? But mm -hmm. if the women don't want to do this because there obviously is consequences to doing this um, right. and, um, you know, legal processes and all this that they may not want to deal with. How can they raise their voice so it can help in this situation to stop or at least uh, start to move, right, in a different direction? Mm -hmm. The first thing that I thought of was I'll do it for them because I don't care. I'll take the risk. Like, I, I'm, I, the, the structure needs to change. So the system that's allowing it needs to receive an inundation of of infuriated bleeding women ultimately like that's the only thing that's going to shape it bleeding women have scared men since the beginning of time that's just kind of how this goes so there's there's a lot to that and there's a lot um there's a lot that happens when there's strength in numbers and i i would encourage those women to reach out for support from other women if they don't want to share details that's okay I have a group with like 1,800 women in it and people share things like this all the time and they're just seeking support from each other and sometimes that support helps to build the strength that's necessary to, to make the, the claims that are necessary to change things. So I would say that the, the actual systems that are allowing this, are the mo that's what needs to receive the brunt of, of what's happening. So yes, it's the individual perpetrators are behaving the way they are because systems support them in doing so. Exactly. Yes. And so the, it's the systems that, and the systems are the same that educated them, that taught them to, to behave and to think that way in the first place. So what happens when women raise our voices, what happens when women gather together is systems start shaking and things start changing. And it's because we have the collective component of like, yeah, it's not just her, it's all these 75 other women too. And now they're standing together and looking at you like that kind of a thing. Like you're going to tell all 75 of those women that, that this is an insignificant situation. And it's ridiculous that we even have to do that. But I would say that finding support individually for that person so that they can get the, the help that they need for, to process some of their trauma may help them to eventually activate their voice. But if there's ever, I mean, I've taken the brunt of what this looks like on in my own personal life in my studio. There was a woman who was assaulted in my yoga studio, didn't want to be, didn't want her name mentioned. So I took the brunt of it. 
And that's something that I've done on countless occasions where I've put myself in the line of fire just because it needs to be handled. And it needs to be something that isn't that we're not afraid to speak about because that fear is is perpetuating it. That fear is is remaining silent in the face of something that's not okay. And we can't we can't let that keep happening. So I would say that the the systems themselves need to feel to feel the thunder. That something yeah. that that there are a lot of people that are not okay with this. And I really hope that any men who hear this who are irked by it, who imagine this happening to their daughters will also go, whoa, like I want to have a place alongside these women who are speaking rather than be someone who was silent while it happened. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, And there's so many things, you know, um, and this is one of the things that I, I don't know, there's so much happening in my brain right now. Um, Two things that did come up for me while you're talking is one, Mm -hmm. Um, how can these women heal from this, right? So they can actually sure. empower themselves sure. and then hopefully be that voice that really the industry, yeah. needs, you know, and not just the industry, it, we're, what we do for ourselves, for everybody, exactly. Yeah. And uh, yeah. because it's not just happening in yachting, this is just the mm-hmm. audience that we're, uh, you know, the, the, the industry that we're in right now, or at least myself and the other girls that are watching, um yeah but yeah how can this woman uh you know you are a womb e- trauma expert so yeah. how how can they start moving towards that because a lot of these women go through these traumas and then they go to psychology yes. and psychiatry and counselors and mm-hmm. i don't know whatever western stuff and yeah. three four years down the line they're still traumatized by it and they're yeah. haunted by it and they can live a normal life and they have never mm-hmm. been able to go back to a boat. And, and it's like, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. obviously it hasn't healed. So you, yeah. you do it very differently. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about that and how do you, uh, how can they actually, uh, yeah, move, start healing? Yeah. It's, I will say the one thing that I believe in with absolute certainty is that healing is a lot more of a spiral journey than a linear journey. We do kind of cycle through many different seasons of um, cultivating more and more um, grace as we're moving through the layers. It doesn't just miraculously one day it's gone. There are many, many layers to experience. Um, but what I will say is that I have, I have much respect for um, neuroscience and I do very much, um, I take a lot from some wonderful psychological theory and there is also a lot with within the realm of somatics and polyvagal theory and how our body remembers information and when our cells remember information and the information is traumatic and then there's this kind of like stunting that happens where the energetics of that experience or the memory of that experience doesn't get a chance to actually have its completion because something horrendous happens and then when that something horrendous happens the body produces a ridiculous amount of of stress hormones and then ptsd ultimately is like reliving that over and over and over again like your body thinks it's still happening again and again and again so even if you comprehend what occurred even if you've come to terms with yes that happened it's no longer happening your body doesn't believe you So what has to change in my experience is that the body needs to feel safe again. And that's what every woman has always ever longed for is to feel safe. And so creating that safety can be a a series of ritual practices that bring you back into connection with parts of your body that you may have cut off or numbed. Um, For example, I do a lot of work within the actual space of the womb, which is all of the the organ tissues that are within the pelvic bowl. So the uterus, the ovaries, the fallopian tubes, the vaginal canal. I choose to use the word yoni because the word vagina actually means a sheath for a sword, which is not something that I subscribe to. I don't believe that my body is, is a covering for someone else's body. I believe that it's my own. <laughs> so I choose a word that means sacred portal instead. So that's my, 
um, choice of language just for context. So I'll do work around um, de-armoring the yoni because we store a lot of trauma there, especially when there is a rape involved. Um, this can actually translate into a lack of sexual drive, um, a lot of different kinds of sexual issues later on, as well as cervical issues and things like that that can happen. The tissues themselves actually store memory and, and when we like cut it off and disconnect, so that can look like um, yoni steaming, womb massage, breast massage, ritual practices that just call you back to nature and so that you're reclaiming your own sacredness and knowing that nothing can be taken from you, that anyone who wants to can try, but nothing can actually be taken from you, that your sacredness is yours and will always be yours. And so that process is a returning to nature and to recognizing your own cyclic rhythms are mirroring everything you're seeing around you. And you start to become kind of astounded at just how connected you are to it. And the more sacred you see yourself, the more you begin to honor your own experience, the more you disempower those traumatic memories from having a hold on you. And when they do arise, you have practices to navigate them. You have plants that are medicine that support your moment where you're experiencing that anxiety or chest tight tightness or constriction in your womb space. And you have plants that support that process, or you have a steam that supports that, or you do a dance that helps your body to move the energy as it's coming. Or maybe you, you go outside and you scream because you just need to move the energy that you didn't get to move in the moment when you held your breath and didn't let anything come out. Or you just say no a lot of times until you've said no the amount of times that you needed to. And all you have to do is say it to a tree. You don't need, and it's about moving the energy so that you get that experience that you needed that you didn't get when it happened. And there's, there's definitely tremendous ways that I support women in this. I educate about all the different types of tools that you can have in your box. And I support them through that journey if it's something that they're choosing to do and they want consistent support through that so that we can customize what they're doing so that it makes sense for what they've experienced. So um, that piece, as well as leaning into sisterhood and leaning into other women who have experienced similar things, that's a huge cathartic component. But it is a personal journey of recognizing that just understanding it in your head isn't enough mm. to actually let it move through your body and to reclaim your body as yours when these things are occurring around you and when you feel powerless. No, it makes sense. I mean, I, I believe that trauma stores itself in the body, so you have to move it in able, uh, yeah. to release it. Um, yeah. so one thing that just kind of popped in my mind, because obviously we're talking about sexual uh, trauma, but yeah. a lot of people do experience psychological trauma. So I yeah. had this one, uh, stewardess come to me and said, you know, I, he never touched me. He never touched yeah. me, but <laughs> it doesn't matter. he said so many things to me. Mm. over and over you know it was like uh, this pervert person right and it yeah. was like just constantly telling her all this and um he she you know she went to the captain and she said okay this is happening to me this guy you know this man is doing this and the captain said well has he touched you and she said no and he said well i can't do anything and i was like okay well that's that's not that's not okay <laughs> yet Obviously, that was her choice to stay in that situation because she could yes, have left. I agree. Yet, mm -hmm. she stayed in the situation until she couldn't take it anymore. She was traumatized, and that's when she had to leave because she couldn't even, like, function anymore. And yes. even though he never touched her, she is mm -hmm. absolutely traumatized. Yeah, absolutely. So, because psychological the warfare. Business. Yeah. Absolutely. And this is similar to... Um, like uh, narcissism in abusive relationships where a person is gaslighted or or made to feel small or made to made to perceive their experience in a way that is distorted from reality and what starts to happen is if any of those things that were said become something that that person then hears so many times that they start they start believing it about themselves whatever it is, or they start seeing themselves in the way that they're being seen, then they can have a massive crisis surrounding their identity as well. So I think that has a lot to do with um, what is occurring. And there's a lot that that person can do with reclaiming their voice. The things that they did not say to the person who was speaking to them need to be said out loud. And there's a lot of that that has to happen. And, and I think that it's a matter of not just that, but did did anything you heard 
Is it something that you already believed about yourself because of society teaching it to you for as long as you did, as they did, like that you are a sexual object or something like that in the, in the way that it was constructed, the sentences were constructed. And it's like, that is something that we adopt into our, into our role. And so because we accept it in some tiny way, it hurts even more because some part of us is like, yeah, that is all I am. And that's what needs to be rewired. And again, it comes back to the same practices of, of honor and recognizing our worth in a really deep way. And that, that is a journey into what it really means to be a woman and, and what it means to have those kinds of, of power and, and rhythms that have been repressed by all of, you know, all of the last 5,000 years for sure, if not before that as well. Yeah. And so there's, I think it's a, there, a lot of what I think is interesting about this is it traces back to like the burning times and the witch trials, because there's a lot of remembered information from our ancestral lines that this is not me being woo woo. This is epigenetic science. So you're welcome to look it up for those who are like, I am a woo woo, but I also bring the science always <laughs> along, along with it. Um, so you, you remember things through your blood, just like your eyes are the color that they, you know, your ancestors decided with their blood that your eyes would be. You also carry memories of theirs through your blood and you carry emotional information. And so if there was a, a ton of repression of voice of the women in your line, you may find that it's unreasonably difficult to speak up in those moments. And that is not something to just say, well, it's just going to be like that. So I'm going to leave it that way. That's something to take back on their behalf, you know, uh, on, for all of the women whose generations and generations couldn't do those things. Yeah. Um, so it is, it is similar. I would recommend the book, Witch by Lisa Lister. <laughs> I love that book so much because it talks about those things. It talks about the, the, the burning of women for being powerful, for having a voice, for not following societal norms, for doing things differently, for being healers, for being midwives, for working with plants, you know, mm -hmm. and, and we learn a lot about why we might remember our experience so, so with so much tension around our throats. Mm -hmm. And another interesting fact about that is the throat and the, the vaginal canal are very intimately connected just as your jaw and your pelvis are very intimately connected because they come out of the same cell while you're growing in utero. Mm. So the jaw experiences what the pelvis experiences and vice versa and the yoni experiences what the throat experiences and vice versa. So that's why we need to make so much sound during like a birthing process or through orgasm or whatever it is. And that's also why when there is any kind of sexual trauma, the voice is even more repressed afterwards because they, they're related. And so things like just making sound and singing and things like that, which used to be a huge part of our cultural awareness as a, as a human species, can be really medicinal for a person who didn't feel like they got to speak up the way they needed to in taking back, taking back power over their experience and their sovereignty, their right to be a whole person who chooses what they allow in their environment wholeheartedly. And I think when we have things like that happen, we stop, we stop allowing a lot of things to be in our space and we start standing up against those things. And this is not to shame any women who are continuing to subject themselves to this. This is not to say, um, you should be stronger. This is to say, I hope that you find the tools that will bring you into a place that is so powerful that you only tolerate what honors you so deeply and that that's what you choose because that's what you deserve. It's not to shame the fact that you haven't spoken up. It's to say, I see you, I get it. I honor you. And here's your power back. Mm -hmm. Like it's right here. You get to take it. It's yours and you get to decide what you tolerate. Well, exactly. I totally agree. And, and just me doing these interviews with different um, people, you know, and them sharing their stories, I have had to reclaim and also forgive myself for not mm. standing up for myself, not standing up for others, not speaking up when I knew that she was mm. not right. Uh, yeah. You know, it is a, it's a whole process of grieving and forgiving and mm. then, like you said, reclaiming, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, and obviously today I stand in a place where I can say no. Um, yeah. Yet, again, I, before I, uh, I got into the call with you, I was reading through one of the Facebook groups of stewardesses and there's a girl who wrote, um, hey guys, 
is this normal that um, they have they've been asking me for uh, X amount of photos of me body wise uh, length wise you know like all this stuff it's like okay, obviously it's not okay uh, and it's not normal yet <laughs> there's all these people coming into the industry they're young women they're like 20 21 um, <laughs> and they're thinking that you know this stuff this this type of things are okay um, mm. and thinking that you know uh, being if, depending on your weight or your height, they'll hire you and all this. And to be honest, like I've been doing this for 13 years. Yes, there is that, but it's not the mm -hmm. uh, norm. You know what I mean? Like people have no, made it the norm because they believe it's the norm, but it's really not. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder. Um, double standards. It's double standards. That's, I mean, ultimately, that's what it is. It's the idea that that women, in order to be considered for this position, have to submit this this stuff that would never be submitted by any men that were applying for any similar or parallel position whatsoever. So that but, part is really awkward. But what comes up for me is, is it really, you know, isn't the industry just a mirror of what we internally haven't mm -hmm. really done? Yeah. You know, oh, right? yeah. because hundred percent. What I see a lot is like, poor me, poor me, the industry is mm -hmm. bad, this yeah. is happening. Yeah. Yet we're still in the industry, yet we're still, you know, more people are coming into the industry, and yet not many, if any, mm -hmm. women, and I'm talking women here, yeah. uh, or men actually, have actually said, you know, actually this is not just yachting, mm -hmm. this is something within myself. Yeah. So Absolutely. How for those who are ready, you know, to stop yeah. blaming, for those who are ready to reclaim, for those who are ready mm. to understand this exterior is just a mirror of my inter internal world, yes. what's your advice for, for them? I, I'm a constant believer in microcosm, macrocosm. So everything we're looking at around us is absolutely reflecting what our internal environment looks like. I definitely believe that's what we're seeing on a global spectrum right now. So when, when you're experiencing a circumstance where, for example, um, the industry is sizing you up, is that not what we do in the mirror every morning? Is that not what, the way that we pick ourselves apart with the creams that we buy and the injections that we think we need and the cutting that we think we need and all of those things. And this is not to shame anyone who believes that that is enriching their life experience. Choose what you choose. But the, the feeling of needing to be um, more than we are is a feeling of unworthiness. It's a feeling of, as I am, I'm not enough. And if I believe that, then I'll believe that about everything in my reality as well. And with that fragmentation occurring, we're, we're not able to do a lot of what we're capable of in the world. So what I would say is that um, start journaling every day and start naming the feelings that you have as they come up. And oftentimes we don't even know what a feeling actually is. A feeling isn't like, I feel like I think the world is weird. That's not a feeling. <laughs> I feel frustrated. I feel angry. I feel insecure. I feel sad. Uh, and then actually starting to see what our emotional experience looks like will show us a lot about some of these patterns. And, and that's one of the beautiful aspects of psychology is we start to see when we built those patterns as we were trying to figure out how to receive love when we were small. Mm -hmm. And so we can have compassion for where things come from and also still be choosing not to let those things run our, our, our lives. I did a video today and I basically called them like an old toaster. It's like having an old toaster in your kitchen that doesn't work anymore, but you keep putting bread in it thinking that it's going to work. That's what these old patterns are. It's like you think that you're going to do the same thing you, you, you did when you were three years old to receive love, which is like, you know, perform or scream and cry or do whatever it is. We, we use the same mechanisms that worked when we were little, even if it's really an outdated program that doesn't work anymore. And if we are exploiting ourselves or if we're putting ourselves in situations where we feel validated by the environment because we're receiving um, compliments or disgusting conduct, you know, like it could go either way. Um, there is a part of us, it, there's a really great book that I think everybody should read called Existential Kink. 
and it talks about it like flips everything on its head and it's like some of the things that we um we think we hate are actually feeding some weird part of our ego <laughs> it's like why we're allowing it is this this strange psychological kink that we have that you know that's why we're attracted to bad men or whatever we're attracted to the men that are going to hurt us or whatever it is things like that right and it's like that some part of us is is eating something up out of that it's we're getting some sort of weird validation and we don't realize it because we don't know ourselves intimately enough so right. the the short answer is you need to know yourself the long answer is that's a huge undertaking that you will have to do at some point or another. So you might as well start doing it as soon as you can and really starting to get to know what your patterns are and checking yourself when they're coming up and checking yourself when you're accepting things that are, that are feeding them and fueling them to continue to rule your reality. Mm, yeah. Mm. I mean, wow. I feel like there's so much content yeah. just in this uh, few uh, minutes. Um, I, I think I'm going to wrap it up uh, sure. just because I, I want them to be, uh, yeah, you guys to digest because I also probably need to digest some. And um, mm -hmm. so what's, if, um, what's your, you know, if somebody is wanting to uh, heal and move forward and, mm -hmm. you know, they resonate with you, how can they reach out to you? How can they find you? Uh, so maybe yeah. can get some help from you. Sure. I'll tell you one thing. The, the majority of the emails I receive, they start with a sentence that sounds something like, I don't even know what I need, but I feel like I need to reach out to you. Almost all of them start like that because it's like the, the, the whole point is that you're not really sure what it is. You just can feel that there's something that feels um, off or achy or it feels um, untended. And it's a mystery. And that's why it's a mystery school, because you're genuinely like, I don't know what this is. And I don't know what I need. But I feel like you know something that I'm that I'm not seeing about this. And I'm like, yes, okay, let me tell you all the things we can do. So email is is my favorite way to, to connect. And then if, if you want to go further from there, we can just have a quick chat on the phone. So my email is howl like a wolf at wildessence.org and you're welcome to send me an email and just you know I, i'm the only one pretty much that reads them and you're welcome to just be like hey so here's what's going on in my experience and don't hold anything back people give me lots of things all about their different situations from their medical diagnoses to what they're experiencing sexually to i get so many bleeding messages throughout my days every day all the time so there's nothing that's that's too much information for me you're welcome to just give me the whole rundown and i'll give you my best counsel from there and then we can talk about whether online courses are a good idea whether working one-on-one -on -one is the best idea based on the the needs of the specific person so i would say email and then if they want to have a phone call we can go from there but you're welcome to learn more about what we do at wildessence.org awesome and i will be uh everybody like below the video you can click on all the uh, the email and the website so you can check out um, what Jesse does and how she could potentially support you. And before we go, just something came up in my mind and it was mm -hmm. when somebody is experiencing some sort of trauma, whether it's sexual, non-sexual, psychological, spiritual, physical, yeah. in the moment, what is the one, mm -hmm. one advice that you could tell them that they could do on their own to potentially help them to move out of that situation. Oh, like if it's in the moment happening? Yeah. Like if they, yeah, exactly. They're like in the moment, not, not obviously maybe while there is some things yeah. happening, you know, like just when, not yeah. in the specific moment that is happening, but like in the situation, you know, like if somebody, I, yeah. Maybe I would say, ask yourself, what would you want for your granddaughter? Mm. Have a moment where you're like, what would I want if this was my daughter? What would I want if this was my granddaughter? And then be the woman who would set that example in all the possible ways. So if that means that, you know, when the story is told, that it's told that you were kicking and screaming and that you were brave and that you fought, then then that's that's beautiful. You know, like if it, you know what I mean? Like really think about like if the story were told to my daughter, if the story were told to my grandma and my granddaughter, what would I want her to hear of me? What would I want her to know of me in this time that I fought back against a system that was sought, that sought to repress me and that I, that I chose to do everything within my capacity 
well, everything within my understanding to to stop it and and also not to shame yourself if you feel um, if you feel that you can't to do your best not to shame yourself if you feel um, too scared in the moment just know that you're far from alone in that experience that that shame is far older than you are mm -hmm. it's oftentimes hundreds and hundreds of years old and and that does have a lot to do with why why we hold ourselves back in those moments so do your best to do what you would want for your granddaughter or daughter to hear the story of you doing and then don't shame yourself no matter what mm, beautiful thank you so much jesse for uh showing up for sharing your wisdom with us and uh i'm sure a lot of people are taking a lot of this and you know like i always say take what you need leave what you don't um and yeah you know for everybody out there if you really resonate with what we talked about here and you feel that you could be another voice uh please mm. speak up. so yes, yeah, absolutely. if you have something to share uh wisdom to pass on this platform is always open for any of you uh mm. yeah it's a wrap <laughs> like, yeah. thank anything. you so much <laughs> all right <laughs> thank you so much for having me you're very welcome bye guys see you next time